Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Claridge, and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. Today, we're going to give you a quick and easy stepwise approach to managing a super common ED presentation, alcohol withdrawal. There are four steps. First, we got to figure out who is actually in withdrawal, then quantify it with a standardized symptom guided approach, next initiate specific treatments, and finally, we got to help them out with some specific advice. We've all been fooled before. The patient who comes in asking for a script of Valium, stating they have really bad withdrawal, and you're thinking, are they really in withdrawal? Are they still intoxicated? Are they just looking for benzos? How can we figure this out? Well, we all know the symptoms of withdrawal. We've all seen it. We've all read it in the textbook. Unfortunately, a lot of these are subjective, hard for us to measure or observe. But there is one thing our experts suggest is the best measure, the tremor. And then there's a few specific things about this tremor. One, it's an intention tremor. That means you won't see it at rest. Two, it's constant. And three, it doesn't fatigue. And here's a great tip. Hand the patient a glass of water and watch them drink from afar. If this is alcohol withdrawal, the tremor should get in their way. And here's something I never knew, that a tongue tremor is impossible to feign. Get them to stick out their tongue and have a quick peek. What else should we be thinking of when we see a patient in withdrawal? It is sometimes really hard to differentiate it from someone who is intoxicated. And we don't want to be giving these patients benzodiazepines. And this makes sense. They have very similar features, like the vital signs. They both can have tachycardia and hypertension. They can be sweaty or agitated. One way to tell the difference is slurred speech. This is not a feature of withdrawal. The other things to keep in mind are other causes of delirium. Look for signs of head injury and do a good neuro exam. They're at higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage. So have a low threshold to get them into the CT scanner. But they can also have infections, toxidromes like sympathomedics, anticholinergics, and toxic alcohols. There's also serotonin syndrome and NMS. All of these make the list and keep them in mind. What about investigations? Not every patient in withdrawal needs blood work. An alcohol level isn't going to help you. A pitfall here is assuming a patient with an elevated alcohol level is not in withdrawal. Chronic alcohol users may experience alcohol withdrawal at serum ethanol levels that are intoxicating to the naive drinker. The ones who do need blood work are those with severe alcohol withdrawal, especially those with delirium tremens. We can screen for other causes of delirium and look for complications such as ketoacidosis and electrolyte abnormalities. It may be worthwhile to get an ECG. Those with severe alcohol withdrawal may get prolonged QT partially related to the hypomagnesia. A urine drug screen rarely changes management, so it's not recommended. Now that we've identified those patients in withdrawal, step two is being able to place them in a spectrum by using a standardized symptom guided approach. Everyone has heard of CWA. It's a bit long and cumbersome, but it has been shown that protocols for alcohol withdrawal improve the quality and consistency of care. Remember that CWA is not for patients who have delirium tremens. You will not be able to get a coherent answer. There's a shorter version known as a shot protocol, but this has not yet been validated. The CWA allows us to measure the severity and monitor it over time, and this will guide your treatment. So this moves us to step three. This is a very important step. Get on top of the withdrawal early. We want to ensure that patients are fully treated before leaving our department. The type of treatment is going to depend on the CWA score. If less than 10, generally no need for treatment. Just observe to ensure that they don't get worse. Between 10 and 20, they require treatment. And this is in the form of benzodiazepines. And we're mainly going to be using diazepam. Reserve lorazepam for patients with liver disease. And what I mean by this is patients with a history of cirrhosis or obvious stigma such as ascites or jaundice. But even if you give diazepam, worst case scenario is that it's just going to have a longer effect. Give 5 to 10 milligrams of oral diazepam and monitor for a response and they may require repeat doses in eMERGE. For those with a CWA score greater than 20, give IV diazepam. The way to do this is with escalating doses, kind of like a pyramid. Start with 10 milligrams IV, then reassess in 10 to 15 minutes. And if they require additional doses, give another 10 milligrams IV. If after 15 minutes it still isn't working, then double it to 20 milligrams and continue down the pyramid until you get to 40 milligrams. Now you're probably looking at this and saying, that's a ton of diazepam. And sometimes that's what it may take. When you get to this level, we should be considering phenobarbital. It is not recommended as a treatment alone for alcohol withdrawal, 
but it is considered when you're giving IV diazepam in the range of 200 milligrams and the patient is still in severe withdrawal. When can a patient be safely discharged? If the CWA score is less than 10, two hours apart, and the tremor is minimal or resolved. And here's a pitfall. Patients with a CWA score less than 10, but still have a severe alcohol withdrawal tremor, these patients are at risk of complications of alcohol withdrawal, so they shouldn't be discharged. And what about giving them a prescription for tapering diazepam? Don't. If they've been adequately treated in the ED, no additional medications will be required. The long half-life of diazepam that you've just given will protect them from developing serious symptoms of withdrawal later on. The last step is providing a pathway to support patients who are trying to quit. This should focus around several key points. Give a strong message. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to get treatment, and you need help. You can't do this on your own, and there are other treatments out there. Medication-assisted treatments such as naltrexone and acompressate should be routinely offered with alcohol use disorders. Similar to smoking cessation, that this can be done through the GP or addiction doctors that prescribe these anti-craving medications. Provide several options for outpatient support if available, like AA or other treatment programs and detox centers. Finally, let them know that with treatment, the way you feel, your mood, social relationships, and work will be profoundly better. So this brings us to the end of alcohol withdrawal, and let's review the four steps. Identify alcohol withdrawal, remember that the tremor is important, use the CWA score to measure the severity, use that score to guide your treatment and make sure they are fully treated before leaving the ED, Lastly, we can make a difference in these patients' lives. Provide them with support. It's not futile. We can dramatically change the view of alcohol use disorders so that it's not just an episodic annoyance, but understand that this person has a serious, long-term condition in which you can have an important role in. Thanks everyone for listening, and see you again next time. <laughs>